Hey guys, this is just a review for the test um, on all the A1 things that we've learned. So, um, basically there was three things we learned. Average rate of change, instantaneous rate of change, and a bunch of limit stuff. So we'll start with the first two. They have to deal with um, the same concept, like finding the slope of a curve and at a certain point. So when we talked about average rate of change, that's where we chose an interval. So we picked some values on the x-axis, like maybe we wanted to find the average rate of change between two and four. Um, and we would just figure out what the slope of that secant, we call it, is. So we basically were just finding the rise divided by the run between those two points which we would call like an average rate of change between two and four seconds. And we would calculate it using this formula back from grade nine, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So you're basically just subtracting your y's, subtracting your x's and getting a value for the slope. So that'd be like our average rate of change. Um, instantaneous rate of change is where we would just have, um, you know, like one point x equals three. And we would like to try to figure out the rate of change just at that point. So that's where we would take a tangent line <clears throat> and we would figure out the slope of that tangent line. So a secant goes through two points on your curve, whereas the tangent line just goes through one point on your curve. And the tangent line, <clears throat> um, sorry. So we did this a few different ways to figure out the slope. So you could actually sketch out your graph, draw a tangent line, pick another point on your tangent line, and actually find the slope of it. I mean, that's an option. Probably the least likely thing that we're gonna be doing because, I mean, who wants to get out a graph and try to draw a tangent line? It's, just, it's not that accurate. So another thing that we talked about doing was picking a value, picking another point on this curve, the purple curve, that's like way closer to x equals three. So even picking something like 3.0001, like those points are so close together. So when you're trying to find like rise over run, they're gonna be a lot better of an approximation to instantaneous rate of change than picking points like three and four. So we talked about using this formula called the difference quotient, which is where we just, um, it's basically y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's the exact same formula. It's just we recognize that the difference in the x values, delta x, we recognize that delta x is actually 0 0.001, which we've been referring to as h. h is just the change in the x values. So it's like you take your second x value minus your first one. So that's all the denominator is. And then the numerator is just whatever those, oops, sorry about that. The numerator is just whatever the y values are at those two points and you're just subtracting them. Okay, so that's one way to do instantaneous rate of change. And then we even went a bit farther and we introduced the concept of limits, which I think I did a bit too early. But we introduced the concepts of limits being, we could use limits to determine the instantaneous rate of change at that point by making this delta x or h value approach zero. So like it's never gonna be actually zero. <clears throat> but it's what would it be if it's approaching zero? So eventually we are gonna sub zero in for h, um, but we're talking about the limit as it approaches h. So if you happen to figure this formula out, then good for you, you'll be totally prepared for our next topic. Either form are acceptable for approximating instantaneous rate of change. Okay, then we moved on to limits. And limits is a giant con giant topic. There's courses in university that you can take that are just on limits. And they're used for many different things. Um, so what we have been working on in this unit is just an introduction to them. So just what they are. So there's left-hand limits. I just I shortened it to LHL, left-hand limits. And there are right-hand limits. So left-hand limits just come from the left side of your graph and right-hand limits come from the right side of your graph. So you start on the leftmost point that you can find 
And if we were trying to find the limit at, as x approaches one, for example, we would just trace this graph until we get to one, and we would determine what the x, what the y value is. So maybe the y value is two, so we know the left-hand limit is two. For the right-hand limit, we'd start on the right side of the graph, and we'd approach one from the right, and we'd determine, oh, it's also two. So the left and the right-hand limit could be equal, or they could not be equal, like in this case. If we approach the graph from the left, let's say we were approaching one again. Well, this value is approaching zero from the left. And from the right-hand side of the graph, it looks like we're approaching whatever this value is. Maybe it's one. So that, in this case, the left-hand limit is zero and the right-hand limit is one, so they're not equal. So we can, be, we can see these things from graphs. Um, there's a section on does a limit exist? So left and right hand limits are different than just saying if a limit exists. So to determine if a limit exists, for example, if somebody said, does the limit as x approaches three of a certain graph, like maybe x squared exist? So the only time it would exist is if the left and the right hand limit exist. So they have to exist. If there is no left hand limit or if there is no right hand limit, then the limit can't exist. So that has to happen. And then the left and the right hand limit have to be equal for the limit to exist. So in this case, I, would, I know that x squared is a parabola. So I know at x equals three, there's a y value of nine. And I believe that from the left and from the right, we would be approaching that same value. So this limit does exist. The left and the right hand limit are the same. So the limit does exist. Okay, continuous functions we talked about. So you can use limits to determine if a, if a function is continuous at a certain value. So if we wanted to determine if a function is continuous at, maybe at x equals a, for example, three conditions have to be met. First of all, the y value at x equals a must exist, must be defined. So it actually has to have a value at x equals a. The limit as x approaches a of f of x must exist. And that limit has to equal the y value. So for example, if we take this one over here, um, first of all, f of a is defined. So that would mean like if x was three, then there is a y value, which is nine. It is defined. The limit does exist. The limit is nine. And the limit is the same as the y value. Perfect, so it meets all three of those conditions, so we know a quadratic is a continuous function. Or we could just use it to prove that it's continuous at that point. So it is continuous at x equals three. Okay, um, then we talked about evaluating limits using some of the limit properties I shared with you in one of the videos. Um, and also we talked about indeterminate forms where we can't actually solve the limit because um, it doesn't exist. So um, these are just a couple examples from the previous videos. So limit properties, I mean, you can use them or not. If you had to find the limit for this as x approaches two, we know that from our limit properties, we can actually find the limit of this one. And then we could find the limit of the other one if we wanted to, or we could just do it all at once. So the limit um, as x approaches two of three x to the power of four would be, 48, I think. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. 16 times 3 is 48. Minus the limit as x approaches 2 of 5x would be 10. And 48 minus 10 would be 38. So we got that limit. This one, we can see that we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 0. But like mayday, if you sub 0 into the denominator, you're going to get something undefined. Actually, you're going to get 0 over 0. You just try subbing it in and you'll get this. So we don't want to get that. We want to see if we can actually approach a value. So, <coughs> sorry, we're going to try to rearrange things um, to see if the limit actually does exist. So this could be one of those cases where maybe we try to multiply by the conjugate. So root x or sorry, root four plus x plus two. 
root four plus x plus two. So we multiply that by the conjugate just to try to um, get x out of the denominator to try to rearrange our equation. We're not really changing it, right? We're just multiplying it by one technically. So we can do that. So we recognize that the numerator is now a difference of squares. So we know that if we were to expand it, like multiply that, all that by all that, we know using dif first different or using um, difference of squares that uh, it's just going to end up following the difference of squares pattern, which looks like that. And then the bottom, I'm not going to expand. I'm just going to write it like this. So my limit as x approaches zero. Um, if I just simplify, I know square roots and squares cancel out, and I know two squared will be four. So I'll get four plus x minus four. I know my four minus four is gonna go away. So I'm just gonna erase those. That should have been plus x, sorry. Um, so I have x divided by x times four plus x plus two, and then I can cancel my x's out, leaving me with one over root four plus x plus two. And now if I sub zero in for x, I get a quarter. So the limit actually does exist. We just had to do some work to figure out what it was. Um, okay, so yeah, that's pretty much it from A1. So you can expect on the test to see some kind of evaluating limits question. Um, a limits question like if a limit exists or if a function is continuous at a point. <clears throat> And definitely expect to see an average rate of change and an instantaneous rate of change question.